Well, so as to not get lost in the forest, not seeing because of the trees, we need to gather ourselves in the study of Hosea and remember something foundational. It is that what we are reading about and hopefully learning from is an entirely, it's an outcropping of God's immutable principles set in stone before the pillars of the world were established. Now certainly while Hosea's prophecy addresses a specific condemnation of the northern kingdom for their idolatry that occurs in the 8th century BC, but with a hope for a future restoration, it shows us what idolatry actually is on both an earthly, fleshly level, but also on a spiritual level. It shows us that idolatry not only exists among pagans, it can and does exist among God's set-apart people, often without any actual awareness of it. And we see that idolatry is first and foremost, it comes from an unfaithfulness of God's people expressed in both thoughts and actions, but stemming from an ignorance of or disobedience, disobedience to His laws and commandments. Thus carving little wooden images and setting up cult worship sites are but examples of idolatry. It's not the full scope of its definition. We also see how God's long-suffering patience with the people He loves most has a limit. And further, what happens when that limit is exceeded? Perhaps even more frightening is that acceptance by God of our repentance after a long time of sinning must never be taken as a given. In fact, even if in one sense God does accept it, that in no way means the dire and tangible consequences for our crimes against Him will be pardoned or averted. And when we read Hosea, when properly translated and interpreted in its historical context, it isn't hard to apply so much of the sad picture that is being painted about Israel to our modern 21st century world, especially the developed Western world and in some cases to the church. Even so, the bigger picture that is much more than similarity of circumstance is that we are getting a much needed glimpse into the mind of the Father about how He processes, how He reacts to the bad behavior of those who insist they're loyal to Him. He doesn't wink at sin one time and then react harshly the next. His justice is fair and even-handed. He provides generous advance notice and warning. Neither culture nor time in history matters, because Jehovah never changes through the ages. Therefore, it's important for us to watch and to identify the God patterns as they're revealed, as they're played out. These things don't emerge only in specific moments in history, like markers placed along a timeline, only to later retreat and subside, or as some doctrinal beliefs erroneously claim, they disappear altogether, replaced with a whole new type of justice administration. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 9. Hosea chapter 9. We're going to start reading at verse 7. Hosea chapter 9, starting at verse 7. The days of punishment have come. 
The days of retribution are here, and Israel knows it. Yet they cry, the prophet's a fool. The man of the Spirit's gone crazy. Because your iniquity is so great, the hostility against you is great. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but a prophet has a fouler snare set on all his paths and hostility even in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their guilt. He will punish their sins. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. And when I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing a fig tree's first figs in its first season. But as soon as they came to Baal Peor, they dedicated themselves to something shameful. They became as loathsome as the thing they loved. The glory of Ephraim will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they raise their children, I'll destroy them till none is left. And woe to them when I leave them too. Ephraim, as I see it, is like Zor, planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim will bring out his children to the slaughterer. I don't I give them. What will you give? Give them wombs that miscarry and dried up breasts. All their wickedness was already there in Gilgal. That's where I came to hate them. Because of their wickedness of their deeds, I will expel them from my house. I will love them no more. All their leaders are rebels. Ephraim has been struck down. Their root has been dried up. They will bear no fruit. Even if they do give birth, I'll kill their cherished offspring. My God will cast them aside because they wouldn't listen to him. And they will become wanderers among the Goyim, among the Gentile nations. Now we concluded last time with verse 6. Now the first several verses of chapter 9 are the announcement that far from divine punishment being a distant future possibility for Israel, the first stages of it have already begun. Already crop failures are appearing. Israel's feeling the pressure of enemies bearing down on them from both the north and the south. And their reaction to these discomforts and these insecurities is to double down on their sacrifices to the Baals in hopes of seeing returned prosperity. Now, we read of Israel's government running around trying to form unwise alliances with Egypt or Assyria, whichever will have them, for national self-protection. Jehovah mocks these feeble attempts because not only are they precisely the wrong things to do, only increasing their sin, they're also useless. They're useless. Nothing can deter what God has already determined is going to happen. So, verse 7 begins, the days of punishment have come. The days of retribution are here, and Israel knows it. In addition to making it clear that the punishments are already underway, it is also stated that Israel's aware of it. But what Israel knows, that's not what they actually believe. They know, that is, they've been told, because Hosea has told them. Now, historically speaking, this was likely written during, probably referring to, a time of respite from their enemies for Israel that took place between 748 730 to about 733 BC. In other words, attacks by Judah on Israel's territory to their south and incursions into their northern territory by Assyria had tapered off during perhaps a 10 year or so period of time such that Ephraim Israel thought that the worst's over. So a return to normality was underway. And this lull in fighting, well, this gave them a false hope, which made them inclined to dismiss the doomsday message that's brought to them by Hosea. Centuries earlier, Moses had spoken the following prophetic words in Deuteronomy, Chapter 31, verses 28 and 29. 
assemble for me all the leaders of your tribes and your officials, so that I can say these things in their hearing, calling heaven and earth to witness against them. Because I know that after my death, you're going to become very corrupt. You're going to turn aside from the way that I've ordered you, and that disaster will come upon you in the Yacharit Hayamim, later times, because you will do what Adonai sees as evil, and you will provoke him by your deeds. No doubt, Israel had either just dismissed these words as having no application to them, or they had strayed so far from their Hebrew biblical faith for so long that they no longer remembered them. And as of now, as was Moses' warning ignored, Hosea's warning. Well, that's thought to be nothing but foolishness. So the last half of verse 7 says, Yet they cry, Well, the prophet's a fool. The man out of the Spirit's gone crazy. Because your iniquity is so great, the hostility against you is great. See, the prophet this is speaking about is Hosea. And what we're reading about is a very rare instance in Hosea of exposing what the people of Israel are actually saying about what it is that they've been told by God's prophet, Hosea. And because of an extended period of relative peace, the people and the leaders of Israel say, well, this prophet's a fool. The term, man of the spirit, that we read here, is actually a derogatory epithet that arose. When the Israelite prophet colonies, called the Nevi'im, were established. Now these Nevi'im went into trances and they spoke ecstatically and they played instruments and they behaved in weird ways. And they were thought, this was all thought to identify them as especially chosen holy men who were acting in the spirit. But later on they were just thought to be kooks. So Hosea more or less was lumped in with that group. Big mistake. Big mistake. Israel determined that Hosea's words couldn't be taken seriously. And the current improvement of their economy, the lack of war for a while, well, this just confirmed it for them. The Hebrew word meshuga is actually used to describe the people's opinion of Hosea. It means crazy. It refers to a person who has lost all grip on reality. To say Israel didn't believe Hosea is to put it mildly. God responds to this atrocity by saying, because your iniquity is so great, the hostility against you is great. That is, because you, Israel, are such great sinners, then the hostility against you, Hosea, by them, is all the greater. The more hardened their minds to God's truth they become, the more they demonize and vilify the truth tellers. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. So because they don't have a credible response to Hosea, they cancel him by labeling him a nut job. And believers, you know, I think I can confidently predict that as the days grow darker in wickedness in our own era, and as God is driven from our institutions and our societies, you too are going to be canceled. You're going to be labeled when you try to tell others the truth. So just know it, prepare for it, because it is inevitable. Now verse 8 is quite difficult to decipher, because there are certain nuances to the wording that are pretty strange. Now we could spend much time here with me explaining to you all the technical issues. But I think I'd rather simply tell you 
that Ibn Ezra, who was an 11th century Jewish Bible scholar, said the way this verse ought to be taken, and I'm in agreement with him, because it best fits the ongoing context. Here is how he says we ought to take verse 8. So be looking at it as I'm explaining it to you. Be looking at verse 8. Here's how Ibn Ezra says we ought to think about it. It's like he's saying, the seer of Ephraim is with his God, the prophet is a fowler's trap on all of his paths, an embodiment of hatred in the temple of his God. Now what Hosea is referring to is Israel's false prophets. They're false prophets, as they operate within the cult of the religion of the Northern Kingdom. So, Hosea was presented in the prior verse as God's legitimate prophet, the prophet who's being shunned and mocked by Israel and called crazy, but the prophets the people are listening to and thought to be the wise ones are false, and they themselves are deceived. Thus, what the people believe is what these false prophets are telling them because they prefer to believe it. It was no doubt a much happier message than what they're hearing from Hosea. Wow, I mean, there's an entire sermon within this thought alone. I'll be brief. The truth is that secular or religious. People believe, prefer to believe whatever it is they want to hear. Just how we are. The popular teachers and religious leaders all throughout history, as in the present, aren't necessarily the truth tellers, but they are the best marketers. Find out what the people want, then give it to them. The people will come in droves to have the validity of their wants and their dreams repeated week after week after week. One of these great marketing lies that is used by some of the most known Christian evangelists of our time is the so-called prosperity doctrine. That is, if you believe in Christ, then God's job is reduced to fulfilling all your material desires. Another deception is that the more you give to that evangelist, God will multiply your finances in like fashion, so you get to even come out ahead of the game. You give in order to get. Another is the false belief that trust in Yeshua gives boundless liberty, which is defined generally as doing anything we want to do. And within that credo that I just said, that credo of liberty, sin is either erased from our reality, and thus it's not even a possibility, or we can ignore sin because Jesus' capacity to forgive and pay for it has no limit. Now, people don't want to believe the worst about their future. I don't. I know you don't. This is why obvious danger signs can be hanging from the rafters and the most vibrant colors, but they go unseen, so they go unheeded. Reasonable preparation can go wanting because it's easier to think the disaster won't actually affect us. People don't want to hear of God's displeasure or of the possibility of His wrath. They only want to know about an all-merciful God that is a kindly grandfather who loves and provides. But the truth is, both of these attributes of God are true at the same time. And whenever we overemphasize or even dismiss one over the other, we're committing idolatry. We are attempting to conform God to our image, rather than adapting ourselves to the God who is. This is what Israel had been doing 
for a very long time. And such behavior became the accepted norm. Thus, anyone who called it into question, that's what Hosea was doing, faced anger, faced isolation from people who liked things the way they were. But those who went with the flow, false prophets, and gave the people what they wanted to hear, why, they were applauded and acclaimed. Verse 9. Verse 9, God is comparing the current Israel with a terrible and infamous event from the past. Now, while we can't be 100% certain that the terrible incident at Gibeah, as recorded in Judges 19, is the one being referred to, and that perhaps there was something much more recent to Hosea that had happened in Gibeah, the gang rape that led to the death of a concubine, and then her master cutting her dead body into pieces, this is the most likely scenario. So even if Israel has but faint memory of this past horror, God's not forgotten it. Just as he remembers this atrocity from centuries earlier, he is also not forgetting Israel's recent unfaithfulness towards him. And as a result of God not forgetting Israel's sins, not forgetting Israel's sins, so their sins are in the first stages now, because we've just been told so, of being punished. There is also a more practical reason that Israel's sins are and must be punished. Sins for them, just as they are for us today, are but violations of God's covenant with them. That definition of sin did not change with the advent of Christ. The violations of God's covenant, the sins, had already occurred. They were anything but hypothetical. You know, it can, it can be seen in a similar way to saying that it's against the law to rob a bank. Once you've robbed a bank, there's no going back on it. You've done it. You can't go back in time now and reverse history. You can't be Superman and go grace real fast around the world and get the world going the other direction. What's done's done, whether you regret it or you don't. The penalty you'll pay for bank robbery cannot then be merely overlooked or forgotten. All sins, just like all crimes, are by definition in the past. They have to have already occurred before there's an actual violation. So just as the violation itself becomes etched in stone, so must God react to that covenant violation, the sin, with the associated and written down covenant penalty, regardless of when it happened. And that is precisely what has been going on from the very first words of Hosea's book. Verse 10 now. Verse 10. Verse 10 shifts gears a little bit, moving now well into Israel's past. And in, in this case, it is all of Israel that is being referred to as opposed to the primary subject of Hosea's book, which is Ephraim Israel. And as Gruber notes, one might be able to characterize Israel's time in the wilderness on their exodus journey as, as a honeymoon. The problem is, during that honeymoon, a crisis erupted upon Israel's arrival at a place called Baal Peor. Baal Peor. And the first thing we must notice is that the metaphorical description of Israel at that time, which in these verses is grapes in the wilderness, or the first bearing of figs on a fig tree, is that their very adoption by Yehovah 
as his set-apart people is of the rarest occurrence in the history of the world. He has only chosen one people, still has only chosen one people as his own. So the event of the Exodus is sort of depicted almost romantically as a man on a journey through a barren desert who suddenly comes across a beautiful grapevine. Welcome, but nothing one would have expected. The second metaphor is of him spotting the very first ripe fig on a fig tree, a signal that finally the season for fruit bearing has arrived. Now this, to Middle Easterners, was always a most joyful and welcome development, something they had been waiting for with much anticipation. Now what is being described is of the happiest and most positive nature, a one-of-one event. And it is likened to the attractiveness, you see, of Israel to God. And yet, that attractiveness lasts only so long as a relationship of respect and love and faithfulness lasts. The question then becomes, by what standard? By what measure is that respect, love, and faithfulness determined? What's the standard for it? The answer is obedience to the law of Moses, the covenant. There is nothing else. Now prior to the incident at Baal Peor, Israel was so very special for God, the apple of his eye the most unique people ever to inhabit planet Earth. Unfortunately, at Baal Peor, the people of Israel committed apostasy by dedicating themselves to what the Bible called Boshet, Boshet, Numbers, starting in uh, chapter 25, verse 1. Israel stayed at Shittim, and there the people began whoring with the women of Moab. These women invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, where the people ate and bowed down to their gods. With Israel thus joined joined to Baal Peor, the anger of Adonai blazed up against Israel, and Adonai said to Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them facing the sun before Adonai, so that the raging fury of Adonai will turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you is to put to death those in his tribe who have joined themselves to Baal Peor. Now, Bosheth in Hebrew means shame or shamelessness. However, as is being suspected by more and more experts on the ancient Semitic languages, it may be that the name for the god that Israel devoted themselves to at that place was called Boshet, his name. And then it's from that memory of that incident, the name Boshet eventually became kind of a colloquial term meaning shameful. The sad fact for Israel is that their history is one of, at best, equal parts proper devotion to Jehovah and rebellion against him. Somehow, like the faithful Hosea, the faithful husband Jehovah continued to love and care for the unfaithful Gomer, unfaithful Israel, but eventually enough was enough. What was the result of Israel's Apostasy at Baal Peor, they became as loathsome as the thing they loved. The honeymoon was ruined. Ruined. And from that moment forward, Israel was not the same in God's eyes. It was never that he demanded or expected a perfect Israel, but he did expect loyalty, 
for the unparalleled position he had placed them in as a, his one and only set apart people. And he couldn't even do that for more than just short bursts of time. Now verse 11, look there. Verse 11 brings up the unhappy reminder that God can reverse redemption history. He can reverse it. Sometimes Christians look upon their moment of salvation as that time that they are given a fire insurance policy that can neither be modified nor revoked for any reason. The Bible, Old and New Testaments tell us a different story. Sincerity of commitment to God is the prerequisite, and it's the ongoing requisite for a redemptive relationship with Him. So much of Hosea is about God refuting Israel's claim of commitment to Him. They believe that that commitment of theirs is all wrapped up in their rituals and in their outer displays of faith. God says, not so fast. He looks to the heart. And if he sees something there other than what is claimed, well, that claim just falls to the floor as a useless vessel, shattered, now worthless. Yes, fellow believers, redemption history, as unsavory as it might seem, and as much as it is usually denied from the pulpit, can be reversed if the so-called trust turns out to be no actual trust at all. You know, and never fall for that concept of pretenders, people who pretended to believe but didn't. Israel wasn't pretenders, but they were deceived, and they were faithless. A person can sincerely commit to Christ. Time passes, then they adopt a way of life and belief that reflects anything but a proper commitment or understanding of who God is. That person was never a pretender. They simply became faithless and they fell away. At one time they believed, but later on they didn't. At one time they were faithful, at another they ceased to be. That was Israel. Therefore, in what can only be a reversal of situation, verse 11 likens Ephraim's glory to a bird that flies away. Now, recall what I explained to you a few lessons ago. In the ancient Hebrew way of thinking, the glory, well, this was simply another name, even another manifestation of God, in the same way they thought that wisdom was. So it's not Israel's glory, in the sense of some kind of glorification that characterized Israel, that flew away. Rather, it was Israel's God, Jehovah, the glory. That's what flew away like a bird. He departed. He separated himself from Israel, just like he's been threatening to do in the book of Hosea. The result is a reversal of redemption history. And specifically, it is said that within Israel there will be no birth, no womb, no pregnancy. Now, the Rashbaum, who lived from the late 11th to the late 12th century, said that this refers to what is being spoken of in Exodus chapter 1. I'm going to read a short excerpt from Exodus chapter 1 to you, starting at verse 7 going through verse 19. Exodus chapter 1. The descendants of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew very powerful. The land, Egypt, became filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, and he knew nothing about Joseph. But he said to his people, Look, the descendants of Israel have become a people too numerous and powerful for us. Come, let's use wisdom in dealing with them. Otherwise, they'll continue to multiply. And in the event of war, they might ally themselves with our enemies, fight against us, and leave the land altogether. 
So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built for Pharaoh the storage cities of Pitom and Ramses. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, <laughs> the more they multiplied and they expanded until the Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel and worked them relentlessly, making their lives bitter with hard labor, digging clay, making bricks, all kinds of field work. And in all this toil, they were shown no mercy. Moreover, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was called Shifra, the other Pua. When you attend the Hebrew women and see them giving birth, he said, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. However, the midwives were God-fearing women, so they didn't do as the king of Egypt ordered, but let the boys live. The king of Egypt summoned the midwives and demanded of them, Why have you done this and let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, It's because the Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They go into labor and give birth before the midwife even arrives. Now because a return to Egypt motif, this is so apparent in Hosea's writings, the Rashbaum has come to a very clever conclusion that now, since Yehovah has, like a bird, flown away from Israel, the blessings of fertility that the Hebrews experienced, even in Egypt, on account of him, are reversed. Now Israel has neither birth nor womb nor pregnancy. Children are stillborn. Women don't become pregnant. They experience miscarriages that until then were somewhat rare for Israelites as compared to other people. Fertility had begun to greatly decrease, all because Jehovah had distanced, distanced himself from Israel due to their apostasy. Now this theme well, extends right on into verse 12. There is a hint of a threat that because of Ephraim's inability to have children to replace the aged and dying, they may become, they may become extinct as a people. So an additional infertility curse is that even if the women should birth children, many will die before they ever reach adulthood. Here this is meant as before the age of childbearing capability. The idea of God abandoning Israel for some unspecified amount of time is reinforced at the end of this verse as God says how full of woe Israel is going to be when he turns away from them, when he flies away like a bird. Moving on to verse 13. We find that something must have occurred in its transmission because it doesn't make a lot of sense the way it's come down to us. So there are several different attempts, <coughs> excuse me, in different Bible versions to interpret this first. Now I'm not going to go through all the several possible ways that certain Hebrew letters were copied down wrong. It could change a couple of words. It might make it more understandable. Ibn Ezra took the view that we need to take verses 11 through 14 as a kind of a unit. Kind of a unit. And so we need to understand them all within the same context. If he is correct, and I, I think it's a good solution, then the best way to translate verse 13 goes something like this. As for Ephraim, as I saw with respect to Tyre, which was planted in a meadow, also Ephraim must bring his children out for slaying. Now even this is awkward, but it can be deciphered a little better. The idea is this. Ephraim Israel is leading its children, that is their offspring, into apostasy, and therefore into calamity and into destruction by committing essentially the same kinds of sins that their forefathers committed at Baal Peor. Now this highlights something I said to begin today's lesson about looking for God patterns in Hosea. Generally speaking, when someone who vows to be part of God's covenant 
breaks the terms of the covenant. It can produce truly awful results in one's home and among one's family. Now the particulars of it are unimportant because the variety of ways these sins can occur and the variety of circumstances they can occur in and the way it can play itself out are nearly infinite. But the pattern and the principle reveal that the consequences for breaking God's covenant for someone who has joined him or herself to it will ultimately affect more than only yourself. We indeed are each responsible before God only for our own sins and not for those of others, whether our parents, our siblings, any other relative. But that does not mean that the sins of others, especially within a family, won't have a terrible effect on those in that family who are otherwise innocent of them. Those Israelites who lived during and before the Assyrian exile were who were being directly punished for their sins against Yahweh. Yet, the hundreds of generations that have come from them in the ensuing 2700 years, well, they've also been adversely affected. Well, verse 14 now. Again, we have a shift of gears. And now we have the prophet himself speaking. And like verse 13, this one can also be a little bit hard to decipher. However, S. Yonah, who is a biblical Hebrew scholar, says that clearly there is a recognized literary structure to this verse that's called staircase parallelism. I thought that for a mouthful. And that helps us to get to the meaning. However, what happens here is that this particular, uh, particular literary parallelism that is unique in that there is an intervening question within it that is inserted. Now, I don't want to get into this complex ancient Hebrew literary structure, but here's how we can understand this verse. First of all, take a look at it, follow with me. First we get an incomplete request from Hosea. It is, give to them. Just those words, give to them. Second, there's a pause, where a rhetorical question is inserted. It is, what shall you give to them? Then third, the incomplete request that opened up this verse is completed when we read, give them womb that miscarries and breasts that are dried up. That's how it comes together. So, to make better sense to our ears, we could just kind of reword this to say, you, God, God shall give to them, meaning Israel, wombs that miscarry and breasts that, that, breasts that won't produce milk to feed their babies. That's the gist of it. So as we pull this verse and some previous ones together, then we get the prophetic declaration that the population of Ephraim Israel can be expect, can expect, they can expect to be decimated by three factors. First, the failure of babies to survive childbirth. Second, miscarriages, and third, women being unable to become pregnant, whether it's theirs or their husband's fault. So now with verse 15, God once again speaks. We now move from the past, okay, this is the past from Hosea's perspective, to Hosea's present. It is because of the kinds of things that go on and have gone on at Gilgal, so this is right now in Hosea's ear, it's a cult site where illicit worship is taking place. It proves that Israel has done anything but improve from the more ancient times. 
as a reminder, where is Gilgal? Well, it's directly across the Jordan River from Baal Peor. Gilgal, at first, when Joshua led Israel across the river into the Promised Land, it was a good and proper <coughs> religious site for worshiping Yehovah. However, over time, it deteriorated. It remained one of the most prominent of the many worship centers for the northern kingdom right up until Israel's exile. But by Hosea's day, it was seen as pure evil by God, because it had come to symbolize all that was wrong about this man-made, hybridized religion that had been created. It was everything that God hated. There was also something else that happened to Gilgal that we must not overlook, and I think it plays a strong role in Hosea's pronouncement against it. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, Then Shmuel, Samuel, said to the people, Come, let's go to Gilgal and inaugurate the kingship there. So all the people went to Gilgal. And there in Gilgal, before Adonai, they made Shaul, they made Saul, king. They presented sacrifices as peace offerings before Adonai there, and there Shaul and all the people of Israel celebrated with great joy. Here is where Israel's first king, Saul, was installed. Now, I think it would be fair to say that God's attitude towards this was, hey, you know what, this whole king thing was never my idea anyway. So while Israel was ecstatic to finally join with the Gentile world by having their very own king, Israel's God was not particularly for this, because he knew where it was going to lead. The idea being expressed here is that the monarchy of Israel was always doomed to failure. Always. It had been so since their very first king. I mean, Saul was a, a disaster almost immediately. And now the terrible Menahem, son of Gadi, was the king in power. And he was perhaps even worse than King Saul. So from God's perspective, Gilgal, well, that was the source of all of Israel's evil because it was there that the monarchy was first formed. We see then, when God says in verse 15, that it was the wickedness of their deeds at Gilgal. It means the wickedness of Israel's kings, the wickedness of their leaders. So Jehovah says he is going to expel them from his house. Now, his house or Jehovah's house is referring to the land where Israel lives, the land God gave them to occupy, the promised land, the land had never ceased to be his. Israel was only given the gift of inhabiting the land, not owning it. It's in much the same way that Adam and Eve were given the gift of living in the Garden of Eden. It certainly didn't belong to them. And since a nation's leaders essentially represent the people as a whole, then the blanket statement of evil applied to the leaders extends to the whole population. God says that he will no longer love them. Now, we have to not take this in the modern Western concept of the term love. See, for us, love is a warm feeling, usually romantic, even erotic, in biblical times, love, first and foremost, conveyed a sense of bonded loyalty. That's what it meant. Thus, it was common to refer to people loving their king. 
shoot, most times they didn't even like their gangs. Rather, it meant that they were loyal to the king. So now, in the reverse, God's loyalty, love, to Israel that had been formed by the covenant agreement at Mount Sinai, well, it's been set aside for the time being. The Lord will no longer show Israel that same loyalty, that same love, because Israel has been terribly rebellious and unfaithful. Verse 16 says, Ephraim has been struck down, their root has been dried up, they will bear no fruit. Even if they do give birth, I'll kill their cherished offspring. Perhaps the most important thing to notice here is the verb tense. Not that Israel will be struck down by God, it already has been. The root being dried up is indeed a metaphor, but it's also an expression. The root goes all the way back to Abraham, the first Hebrew. However, in likening Israel to a plant, their condition is as a dying nation. Branches of a plant can be pruned off to save it, but when the roots all dried up, well, the death of the plant's pretty well assured. Thus the plant, Israel, has lost all means of bearing fruit, good fruit. The fruit being spoken of is descendants, a continuation of their families. God says this fruit of family that is so cherished is also going to get killed off. Now, this is a threat that's already been made in earlier verses. However, when something's repeated, it's because it's being emphasized. Well, verse 17 reverts to Hosea speaking. Now, sometimes Hosea quotes God, sometimes Hosea speaks for himself. The final verse of this chapter says bluntly that God is casting Israel aside for the reason they did not listen to him. How did God speak to Israel? He did it through his covenant with them. God's written Torah is how God spoke to Israel, and it's how he speaks to all who want to worship him. All. So Israel's punishments are well earned and just because they wouldn't listen to God and how to walk in his ways. Now honestly, to translate the Hebrew word used here to listen completely misses the point. For modern Westerners, listen mostly means a passive kind of hearing. The Hebrew used here is Shema. It means hear and obey. Take the obey part out of it, and Shema loses its meaning. It's not Shema anymore. I'm going to close today with something Douglas Stewart wrote in his commentary on Hosea because it really well sums up what's happened. He says this, Israel's coming calamities are their own fault. If they had not been blatantly unfaithful, even in their worship, if their deeds had not been evil or their officials not rebellious, if they had not refused to listen to Jehovah when he called them to repentance, oh, the situation could have been different. Now this is the life lesson that I pray we all learn well and heed. Okay, we'll open up Hosea chapter 10 next time. Okay? Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning. Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.